Uh, yes, thank you, Tobias. And uh, uh, thank you to all who have helped to put this together. Uh, so our dear participants, I would first say good morning or good day, wherever you are. And uh, you're welcome to this session of the World Health Summit uh, titled Perspectives on Sustainable Health uh, in Africa. And the main objective of this session are to introduce the concept of uh, sustainable health uh, and how it can be used to tackle complex health challenges today and tomorrow in the Africa region, but also to get some ideas around the initiative that has been started on establishment of a virtual center of excellence for sustainable health. And then we shall put uh, and concretize uh, these ideas that can be carried uh, forward. Uh, once again, I would like to introduce to you our moderators for this uh, session. Uh, we have our co-chair, Associate Professor Tobias Afven uh, from Karolinska Institute, and is also one of the co-chairs of the newly established Center of Excellence for Sustainable Health. Uh, and I, uh, your co-chair, Roy William Maega from the School of Public Health, College of Health Science, Makerere University, uh, one of the uh, co-founders of the Center of Excellence and a team member uh, from Makerere University. Uh, over to you, Tobias, on the next uh, uh, step. Thanks a lot, Roy, for the introduction to the session, and thanks to all of you for the patience and for being here. And it's nice to see that we now have more than 50 participants with us. And before we start the session, we would like to get to know a bit more about all of you who are here, both speakers, presenters, and also the audience. So please go down to where you have the question and answers and write in that, in which country are you based now? And just write that as a question and answer and in which country are you based? I can see some, uh, we have participants from Uganda, from Sweden, from Sweden, uh, it's great. And more from Sweden and more from Uganda coming in all the time. It's great, that's what we thought from Uganda and Sweden, uh, lovely. Now let's continue with the second question. In which kind of organization are you based? Is it in academia? Is it in the private sector, the civil society, the ministries? Write that in the answers and questions again, please. We see academia, university, academia, academia, uh, still from Uganda. Uh, it will be a session with participants from most academia, but also some private sectors in Sweden and Uganda. That's excellent for us to know. And please, during the whole session, use the answer in questions, write if you have comments, questions, anything you would like to raise, and Roy and I will take that with us to the speakers and to the panelists. And you can write that all the time. One more question to all of you, but now I want you to take up the phones and please enter in the browser on your phone, menti.com. You can see the address on the top of the slide, www.menti.com. And once you're in there, you have a code 92718039. Menti.com and then enter the code 92718039. I hope that you managed to get in. And once you're in there, please write in what do you see as the key health challenge for the 21st century? And write that if possible with one maximum two words and then submit it and we'll see this. What's the key challenge for the 21st century? Uh, we see, please write in the menti.com. Continue, we have another two minutes for this. Write it in.
have some more time to get in menti.com and then use the code and then write what's the key health challenge for the 21st century and we see healthcare delivery inequity gender inequity climate poverty ncds uh, pandemics ncds uh, will bring this with us the equity issue uh, more than one of you healthcare delivery ncds climate and poverty uh, one more minute. And pandemics, something that we're all working on at the moment. Thanks a lot to all of you. We'll bring this with us. And there I would like to hand over to Roy again. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Tobias. And uh, uh, participants, we have three distinguished speakers this morning, and they are going to take a little more incisive discussion uh, on the issue of uh, sustainable health uh, in three different perspectives. Uh, and we shall introduce each as they come. And the first calling on the first of our three speakers, uh, Professor Ole, Petra, uh, Ole Petra Otashen. Uh, Ole, uh, Professor Otashen is uh, president of Karolinska Institute, and he will address us on the first uh, topic that is sustainable health. What is it and why? Uh, Professor Otterson, you're welcome. So I hope it works. Very well. <laughs> good, good. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, and uh, I'm very, very happy to uh, be here with uh, all my colleagues and collaborative partners, and uh, also fantastic to share this, uh, this session with, um, with uh, Sumia and, uh, and Roda, not least. So um, great to be here. So um, I'm tasked with saying a few words about uh, the term sustainable health, and um, it's really, I think, a fantastic time to introduce this concept because the pandemic has really shown us that uh, we have to think in terms of sustainability, Agenda 2030, and to add the time dimension, the preparedness dimension to everything we do in terms of uh, uh, research collaboration. So what is sustainable health? Uh, Stefan, who is with us today, helped uh, forge this uh, definition of sustainable health. And as you can see, it's very much based on the Brundtland Commission that was uh, that published its report all the way back to 1987. And uh, there are two very important uh, terms in this definition. One is the multisectoral um, area uh, term that tells us that we have to look at uh, health in a cross-sectoral manner, knowing that uh, we have to reach beyond the health sector to really improve on health. And also uh, this definition contains um, the um, reference to the planetary boundaries, which is very much in evidence also, of course, in Agenda 2030. So this definition tries to put health and research on health into Agenda 2030 perspective going all the way back, as I said, to the Brundtland Commission. So why sustainable health? It's quite obvious because uh, we are in fact lag lagging behind now when it comes to our shared ambition to reach the goals embedded in uh, UN's agenda 2030. And uh, I think it's fair to say that COVID-19 has highlighted the interdependence between health. And as it says here, all the socioeconomic and political factors that impact on health. And uh, I was happy to say, happy to see the outcome of the, um, uh, the Menti uh, quiz that inequities figure prominently uh, when it comes to uh, the challenges ahead. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the inequities in health have been exacerbated during this crisis. Now it's a question of seeing how we can mend this and uh, reduce these inequities. So sustainable health, to be very brief, uh, has to do with six different points. Sustainable health is, as I said, a prerequisite for reaching the 2030 agenda, certainly. It implies that we meet the health needs. 
um, of the present without compromising the health of future generations, certainly. It depends on reciprocity, symmetry, and community engagement. It requires, as I said, a multi-sectoral approach, system thinking. Absolutely, we have to think about health in a system perspective. And sustainable health must be based on due attention to all these determinants that we know are essential to understand if we are to make headway when it comes to a, a better health. And finally, we should go beyond research and see implementation as the final goal. I think that one of the things we have learned during this pandemic is that so much knowledge is out there, but so much knowledge is not yet implemented as new policies, as new guidelines in the attempt to improve the world's health. Um, the time dimension is very important, and uh, together with um, Roda, in fact, we published a paper not long time ago uh, where we say that we need universal preparedness for health. Preparedness is exactly what we need, I think, in this collaboration, the time dimension. And uh, just as a final uh, image, I think it's uh, absolutely important, uh, or essential importance, and paramount importance, to think along the lines of time, time dimension. It's not sufficient to look at what happens during the acute crisis or to distribute extant vaccines. We have, through our research, uh, aimed to build a much better preparedness before the next uh, crisis hits. And then when it comes to Africa, of course, we have to ensure that there is adequate tech transfer, that there is an adequate understanding of how vaccines can be duly produced also in the African continent. And I hope that our research collaboration will contribute to this. So it was a very brief uh, description of what we think are key issues when it comes to our collaboration and key issues when it comes to the term sustainable health. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh... Uh, Otasen, and in your presentation, you raise very, very pertinent issues, and these bring some key questions in mind. And uh, Prof, uh, the first question I would like to ask you, we're in the middle of a devastating pandemic, and uh, as you alluded early in your presentation, uh, which we think uh, has turned sustainable health on its head. How will the pandemic force us to rethink the way we work, and what does that mean with regard to international cooperation and uh, how it should look like now and in the future? Well, the most important thing, obviously, is that uh, all these inequities that are, I would say, that permeate the uh, agenda to 2030, all these inequities, they have uh, been uh, unveiled and made even more distinct during this crisis. Now we see that uh, the inequities that perhaps are were looked at as uh, something esoteric, something abstract, that these are real challenges that we need to focus on when it comes to research and imp implementation. So I think on the positive side, the tragedy of COVID-19 is also, some, it's some, also something positive about it because it has given us a momentum to really uh, increase our efforts to reduce the uh, tremendous health inequities that uh, we see in the world today. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, another question. I, I, I recall you led a Lancet commission, and I read through uh, the output of this commission, the Commission on Global Governance for Health uh, that was published in 2014. How should this work be used today and in the future, what is the implication of that work on what we are facing today and where we are going? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for your reference to our Lancet Commission on um, uh, health inequities. At the time this commission was, um, uh, this commission report was published, uh, it did not uh, receive the attention that we hoped for. Uh, and that is perhaps because all these inequities were rather abstract at the time. Now we see that these, uh, these inequities uh, hit us hard, and not least the inequities hit uh, poor countries very, very hard, disproportionately hard. I, in this uh, Lancet report, what we said is that we have a supranational governance structure 
that uh, is not uh, really living up to the challenges. Um, WHO is doing a fantastic work, but we don't have the multi sectoral approach to health that we need to have on the supranational level. I, I think that uh, what this commission report tells us today is that we have to look at the supranational governance system to really see to it that it can handle this type of crisis in a much better way the next time around. And the independent panel on, uh, on, the, on pandemic uh, preparedness uh, says exactly the same thing, that next time we have to have a supranational governance system that is better equipped to uh, deal with this crisis rapidly and efficiently. In uh, the Lancet report, we identified several global governance dysfunctions that now should uh, receive due attention and be rectified. And a stronger, even stronger WHO is, uh, of course, a very important uh, ingredient in uh, the future thinking about uh, more efficient supranational governance system. Yeah, and, and, and Prof, maybe if you could take a thought uh, you, you've just said that there's, there's a lack of uh, multi-stakeholder uh, 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 platforms, mm -hmm. uh, multi-sectoral uh, approaches. Uh, how can we develop multi-stakeholder platforms uh, to develop capacity, especially for Africa, uh, where we need rapid technology transfer and uh, other issues to yeah, respond? Uh, it would be very nice also to have Sumia's um, uh, reflections on this because that's a very important question. What I think an, is uh, an important step forward is to look at the life science sector. This has been disregarded in the debate, but we have in in the in most countries in, uh, we have a very strong life science sector where industry, healthcare, and academia meet and share the same goals. Why don't we try to recruit all the actors that are already in place in the life science sector to really go for tech transfer, capacity building? I think that's uh, uh, one way to, to proceed. We already have the, the stakeholders there in the life science sector. So this is what we're trying to do now. And Stefan is part of this. Also, when it comes to concrete projects with Africa, to see how we can provide input to um, a better tech transfer and capacity building also when it comes to vaccine production facilities. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Over to you, Tobias. Thanks a lot, Roy and Ole Petter, for that uh, beginning. And I'm now very happy to invite Dr. Roda Wajense, Professor and Dean of the School of Public Health at Makerere University, and also one of the co-chairs of the Center of Excellence for Sustainable Health, to address us on the topic, role of academia and partnerships in achieving sustainable health. A warm welcome, Roda. Thank you, uh, Tobias, uh, for the introduction. Um, just need to adjust my slides. Sorry. Um, Apologies for the delay. So um, I'm happy to share with you my perspectives on the role of academia and partnerships in achieving uh, sustainable health. Uh, this is very slowly um, moving to, sorry. Um, So um, in terms of uh, uh, achieving sustainable health, I think that the academy has a very, very critical role in terms of moving us uh, forward. Uh, first, because we do a lot in terms of uh, research and innovations, and we actually ought to do more, but we also produce the next generation of leaders uh, to move us towards sustainable health. So starting us off with uh, research and innovations, we need to be able to uh, engage more in terms of uh, production and actually co-production of uh, scientific evidence as well as innovations in partnership with the critical stakeholders 
as emphasized by uh, um, Professor Otterson, but we also need to go beyond producing knowledge and innovations to translating them into action. And we need to be able to uh, generate solutions and new technologies and be able to solve the problems, the complex problems that are presented um, uh, across various SDGs if we are to achieve sustainable health. But we also need to engage in uh, uh, conducting uh, robust evaluations of uh, programs out there to show what works and what doesn't work so that we can be able to um, uh, contribute to uh, prioritization of uh, workable solutions. But I also need to emphasize that one of the challenges we have had is uh, too many silos across disciplines, too many silos across age groups, too many silos across gender, and so many things that keep us apart. If we are going to generate solutions to complex challenges, we need more players on board. We need to work across boundaries in disciplines. We need to work across sectors. But we also need to engage the younger people. There is a tendency for scientists to stick together. The professors working alone, we exclude our students. We exclude the younger uh, scientists who are the next generation. And this doesn't help us. They think differently. They are really smart when it comes to using technologies. They are also the future. So if we are thinking sustainability, we need to engage them uh, more. So we need to break the silos across disciplines, work more with our students and younger faculty, and engage them meaningfully in whatever we do. Work across geographies, across gender, we need more diversity. And this needs to be reflected even in the way we teach, the way we do our research, and all the other activities um, within academia. In terms of teaching, we have done so much in terms of knowledge and skills, and we are producing a lot of experts. And perhaps we have too many experts, and maybe this is the reason why we have so many people that are so good at criticizing what doesn't work, but they are not necessarily generating solutions for us. So we need to be able to transform the way we teach so that we can move towards professionalism, addressing issues of socialization, values, and also moving even further towards leadership attributes so that we can have enlightened change agents that can be able to solve problems, that can be able to work across sectors, that can be able to work across disciplines and across geographies and many other differences that we might have. This requires a review, a very critical review for us in academia to rethink how we actually do the teaching and learning. And we can't just keep speaking about it. We need real change. In terms of networking and uh, engagement, um, this is one of the areas where we haven't done as well. We have so many partnerships that are often not sustained, that are based on grants. And when the grants end, then the partnerships end. We need to be thinking uh, about engaging and working with universities and all the other sectors, public, civil society, and private sector in a longer term. And, and I'm glad that Karolinska and Makerere have had a very long-term partnership. And I hope it can continue uh, for many years to come as we explore expanding this to other sectors. We need to also work with populations and rally them uh, to generate solutions. Sometimes we are struggling with solutions that they have, but sometimes we also don't fully understand them. So we come up with interventions and we think that they should take them up and they reject them. We have seen this in COVID, whether it's the uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions or the vaccines more recently, we are not engaging enough with the communities. We need to also move towards shaping policy, lobbying and advocating uh, for changes. And again, this is another area where we have challenges as academia. We tend to engage with ourselves, again, not working with people who are not like us. And we think advocacy is not for us. Perhaps we need to rethink this as well. And then we need to support the translation process by developing tools that can enable more players to uh, uh, act in sustainable health, but also enable policymakers to be able to uh, change policies as well as practice. In terms of uh, uh, thinking uh, more efficiently as we think sustainable practices, we need to rethink again what we are doing. How efficient are we with our practices, including within the academic settings ourselves? Issues of saving energy, we are talking about this for policies and practice, but are we actually doing this? Uh, being more efficient and minimizing wastage, 
sharing resources, infrastructure, and facilities. And even the way we engage, uh, COVID has now forced us to engage in a virtual world. And perhaps we need to do more of this. There is still space for us to engage in person and have hugs and build relationships. But perhaps moving forward, we need to rethink uh, what the appropriate mix is of our engagements between a virtual as well as in person so that we can save our environment. Fewer flights uh, saves our environment, but it also saves money. So we need to rethink how we are doing a lot of things in terms of being more efficient so that we can preserve and enhance our ecosystem. In conclusion, uh, to be able to move towards sustainable health, academia and partnerships uh, are really crucial and we need to rethink the way we are working. The research and innovation to generate solutions, the how is really critical in terms of how we engage across uh, sectors, across disciplines, across generations, across gender and all the uh, differences that we might have. We need to be able to transform our education and we should have done this yesterday. So we need to move really quickly. Partnerships and engagements across uh, public, across uh, policy, across uh, uh, the communities. We need to do more of this. We need to adopt uh, sustainable uh, practices. We need to work across boundaries. And finally, to appreciate uh, the Center of Excellence for Sustainable Health, Makere University, Karolinska Institute, and all our partners, uh, currently uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Somalia, and looking out to expand this further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roda, for this very nice summary about what we need to do in research, education, networking, engaging with a broader society, and also concrete steps within us so we can be sustainable. We have received one question from the audience, and that's regarding the lack of implementation from academia. And you mentioned that, but in your opinion, what is the concrete steps that we can do already now to bridge the gap between academia and policymakers? So thank you for that question. I think we need to get back to the very basics uh, in terms of ensuring that we integrate uh, sustainable development goals within our thinking, within our research and innovations, within our teaching. Right now, there are very few universities that have fully integrated sustainable development goals and thinking within the teaching that we do. So we are sending out uh, the people that we teach that are not prepared sufficiently to be able to contribute to this. And perhaps we ourselves need to retool to be able to uh, uh, contribute better to this. So we need to get back to the uh, basics, uh, evaluate where we are, quickly integrate this in our teaching and learning within our uh, uh, research and innovations, but we also need to rethink how we are partnering. Who are we partnering with and how? We are excluding too many people that need to participate uh, in this area. We are excluding so many disciplines that are crucial that we ought to bring on board. Uh, just this morning, I was in a session where we were discussing issues uh, um, uh, of, of obstructive uh, lung disease, and we are thinking about the risk factors. And um, the presenter ably raised issues of biomass uh, used for cooking uh, in Africa, here in Uganda. It's still predominant, but when we come to the conclusions, and recommendations, then we shift to the clinical interventions. And the team does not include anybody that understands fuel and how we can move towards safer fuels in terms of cooking. So the energy issues, uh, so perhaps in that kind of collaboration, if they had somebody that understands energy issues, uh, we might be able to generate broader perspectives beyond the clinical intervention. So we need to work more across disciplines. We need to uh, feel more comfortable or working with people that are not like us, uh, both in teaching and research and innovations. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rhoda. And in the, uh, we want to save some time, so I think we need to move on. But please, everybody, continue to write in the questions and answers if you have questions or comments. And thanks again, Rhoda, for that very nice speech. And with that, I would like to hand over to Roy again. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Professor Roda, and uh, thank you, Tobias. And I would like to invite our third speaker this morning. Uh, our third speaker is Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, 
Uh, uh, Dr. Sumia is uh, from WHO Geneva, and uh, she's to address us on the topic research, research for sustainable health. Uh, the role of multinational organizations like WHO and academic partnerships. You're welcome, uh, Dr. Sumia. Thank you very much, uh, Roy and Tobias, and also thanks to the two previous speakers, Professor Otson and Professor Wanienze, for having really set the stage and uh, identified the critical issues. So I'm a researcher myself. I'm a TB researcher who's worked in India for many years and uh, started uh, my career as a researcher uh, with, uh, in an academic institution. And the focus, of course, is on doing the best kind of research to answer you know, the questions that we think are important, and then to be able to publish and disseminate that information. And it was much later in my career that I recognized how important it is for researchers to be linked with policy making. And I think uh, we have recognized today that one of the issues that many countries face is the siloed approach, where you have the academics who may be doing very important work, very important research, but somehow they're not connected with the policymakers. And when researchers go to policymakers with a completed piece of work and then expect the policymakers to implement the findings of that uh, piece of work, it's often not very successful because the policymakers have a different lens with which they view. Uh, they have priority, priorities that they consider are important and very often these are competing priorities. So I may think that TB is the most important problem that needs to be addressed. But at that particular time, the person who has a limited pot of funds and has to make decisions is going to have to base it on on many factors. So it's, this is what, why we now have this terminology called learning health systems. That was really something that's been, that's come out of discussions at the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research here at the WHO, where we are now promoting this idea that research needs to be embedded within health systems. Now we're not talking about all research here. There's a lot of basic science research, upstream work that needs to continue to have to happen in academic centers and universities and, and R&D centers and, and private industry and so on, especially if it's around product development. But I'm talking about the kind of research that you know, really has an impact on policies, on programs and on delivery of healthcare. And I think the COVID uh, pandemic really pushed innovation, it, it, it forced, us to think differently, to deliver health services a bit differently. Some countries did it better than others, uh, but it shows us that there are different ways of doing things, whether they are more efficient or less efficient, whether they actually result in better health outcomes or not, this needs to be investigated. And particularly, I was at a session earlier today, we are releasing the report on the ethics and governance of artificial intelligence in health. This, uh, so the use of artificial intelligence and digital tools is a good, example of uh, opportunities to, to really uh, use these tools to improve health outcomes, to improve healthcare delivery, to assist both clinicians and healthcare workers, but also patients access the best health services uh, in areas of the world where there may be less specialists, you know, radiologists and pathologists could be lacking. And this is where AI could play a role, but this needs to be tested. It needs to be tested, especially in environments in low and middle income countries where the data sets on which these algorithms have been trained may not have been uh, captured, may not be representative of those countries. So an algorithm trained, uh, you know, based on mainly Caucasian data will may or may not work well in an Asian or an African setting. So this is why we also, I think, need global partnerships, uh, global collaboration, uh, global governance rules for how data will be collected, shared, used. And again, later this week, we have a, a summit that's going to address some of these issues on data governance, particularly research data, which has traditionally been, you know, the, the property of individual research groups, then it's published and, and it's not put to use after that. So if we could have systems globally of sharing data with a certain governance, certain rules around that, 
we could try to break some of these uh, barriers and have very large data sets, which are then used for global uh, public good. The other point I wanted to make was really about uh, building the capacity. And I think uh, Rhoda mentioned why it's so important for the universities and academic centers to build mm -hmm. elements of leadership, of transformation, of gender equality, particularly in research and WHO through our research programs like TDR and the, and the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, as well as the Human Reproductive Research Program, have large programs of capacity building. Many of them are focusing particularly on women, on younger individuals. We know that 60% of people in Africa under the age of 25, they are the future. They are the ones who are going to determine um, the policies and practices of the future. So really important to hear their voices. Unfortunately, in many panels like these, it tends to be uh, over uh, represented by people who are older. Uh, perhaps we need to start changing that. So, so focusing on, on gender equality at the stage of education from the very early to later stages, giving people opportunities, developing global partnerships and, and collaborative mechanisms. You know, we have, WHO has a collaborating centers that uh, we rely a lot on for a, a lot of research, a lot of policy work. Of the 822 collaborating centers that we have, only 5% are in on the African continent. Clearly this needs to change. We need, we need again, through twinning, like the relationship perhaps between Makarere and, uh, and the Karolinska Institute could be a good example of how to bring more collaborating centers, bring more fellows, uh, develop uh, a stronger voice for leaders uh, from uh, Africa. And um, this is something that we're very much uh, committed to as well as in, in all our uh, committees and so on. So I think maybe I will stop there and uh, turn it back to you, uh, Roy, for any further questions that you may have. Yes. Uh... Uh, Tobias? Thanks a lot, Somia, Oops. for that. And very glad to hear mentioning also the collaboration between Kea and Makerere as an example about how we can work. And something that both Ole Petter and Roda also brought to the table. It's this issue about getting multi-sectorial work. And how do you see the role of WHO in that and bringing other sectors into the important issues of leadership, networking, and building big data sets? What do you see? How can WHO work there? This is very important, uh, and uh, yes, it was mentioned uh, both by uh, previous speakers, because when we think about health, it's clear that the determinants of health are not within the health sector's mandate and purview. The determinants are upstream, and Rhoda gave a very good example of indoor air pollution leading to chronic lung disease, and there's no point training more doctors to take care of chronic lung disease if we are not going to address an air pollution we know both indoor and outdoor air pollution are affecting 90% of the world's population today. So there are very few people in fact who live in areas with, with uh, good air quality, water, uh, nutrition, sanitation, mental health are some of the other factors that need to be addressed if we are going to have a healthy uh, society. So WHO also, as you rightly said, traditionally our stakeholders and our uh, the partners and countries are the ministries of health. And this is the mandate that we've had uh, since the inception in 1948. It's the ministers of health who sit on the World Health Assembly. But recognizing that health goes way beyond the ministries of health, we, in our five-year strategic plan that we call the GPW-13, that was adopted in, in 2019, we do talk about a third pillar. So we have three pillars, the first one being the universal health coverage, which very much aligned with the 2030 goals. The second pillar being around protecting people from health emergencies and outbreaks. Clearly, we've seen the art preparedness was not good enough to protect us from the pandemic. And third is on healthy lives. And the healthy lives really focuses on the risk factors and determinants of health and is completely multi-sectoral in its, in its approach. I think a good example is, is the tobacco framework on tobacco uh, control framework convention, which looks at laws, which looks at policies, which looks at fiscal approaches, incentives and disincentives uh, on 
to reduce the use of tobacco. I think we need to think about similar approaches for other uh, areas, you know, whether it's road safety, which again, we have a very large program on, or whether it's around air pollution. These need global efforts. And so I think an example is a pandemic treaty that's now being proposed to really uh, look at how do we prepare for uh, pandemics, which really require a global set of agreed principles and rules. And similarly, we need to identify these other areas. Climate change is of course one that's, that already has a, a mechanism, but there need to be other areas as well where we might need these similar kind of framework conventions where necessarily we bring in uh, other sectors. But meanwhile, I think we need to make the case that ministries of health need to be advocates for the policies change that needs to happen in other ministries. And uh, that's where I think we can play an advocacy role, uh, even if we're not the actual implementing um, agency in the country. Yes, thanks uh, a lot, Sonia. Uh, and that's leading maybe to that uh, Center of Excellence for Sustainable Health. That can be a WHO collaborating center in sustainable health. And with that, and in saving time, I would like to continue. And you mentioned the importance of listening to young voices. And with that, I would like us to listen to two young voices. And the first one is medical student Alma Nordenstrom from Karolinska Institute. And the second one is the PhD student Roland. Growing up, I learned about different world. challenges in the world. War, conflict, poverty, climate change, etc. And then it was the health ones. Few people talked about the interlink between health and other societal challenges. But then I discovered sustainable health and suddenly I shared these pair of glasses with others around me. Because for me, sustainable health highlights this intricate puzzle of health in society as a whole. It highlights the need for a long-term system-based approach for continuous advancement in healthcare in the 21st century. In my pursuit in medicine, the concept of sustainable health has informed me to look for prevention and treatment to go far beyond the work in the clinic. Consequently, for me as a doctor, I need to obtain different skills and knowledge in order to not just be a doctor for the patients and diseases present today, but of those of tomorrow. To me, sustainable health is about ensuring quality health and well-being for all, now and in the future. For us to realize sustainable health, we need to start by producing the quality health that we desire. The production of this health starts at the household level because the decisions on whether a child is immunized, whether they go to school, the kind of nutrition that they have, all start at this level. Several households then make up a community. So my research is focused around activating community structures to produce health, mostly for non-communicable diseases prevention. Empowered communities, informed communities, and enabled communities can produce health that is sustained across generations. Yes, uh, th thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, uh, and we have listened to our speakers uh, and what they have to say about this uh, big issue of sustainable health. And we've also listened to the voice of the young and upcoming researchers. Now, we are going to have a panel of discussions. Uh, it's a multi-sectoral panel, uh, and they will take this issue further, drawing from the different perspectives in which uh, they, they, they come. Uh, and our distinguished panel is uh, composed of four discussions. The first is Dr. Mugabe, uh, who is a senior official in the non-communicable disease department of the Ministry of Health in Uganda, and is leading the technical unit of the department. Uh, and Dr. Teresa Piloya is a pediatrician and a senior lecturer here at Makerere University. She's also a senior board member of the Uganda Diabetes Association, to which she has also been board chair, and uh, the reason for which she's on this panel. Dr. Alan McKenzie is a senior official at uh, AstraZeneca, uh, re representing AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals under their office in Africa. And lastly, uh, but not least, Professor Stefan Schwartling-Peterson, 
is a professor of global uh, transformation for health in Karolinska Institute. But before that, he has just been the, uh, the chief of health at UNICEF. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, we, we, we hope to have a vibrant discussion on this issue. Uh, over to you, Tobias, to start off the discussion. Thanks a lot, Roy. And we will start the discussion with some brief introductions from all the four of you. And let me start to ask you, Dr. Mugabe, you have substantial experience in the policy process for health within the government in Uganda. And what does sustainable health mean to you in the perspective of policy and government? Please, Dr. Mugabe. Dr. Mugabe? Did we lose him? We had him with us just a couple of minutes ago. When we wait for Dr. Mugabe, let me jump straight to, and then please, Dr. Mugabe, when you rejoin, tell Roy and me, and we will let you in. Teresa, I will uh, move straight to you instead. And Dr. Teresa, uh, you have worked uh, a lot as a senior executive in a patient's organization, like uh, Roy said. What is sustainable health for you, and can it mean in the perspective of the civil society and patient's organization? Well, thank you so much, Tobias, for that, and thank you for the humble introduction. And, of course, for me, on the side of the patient organization, Sustainable health entails adoption of innovative strategies committed to improving lives of the people and safeguarding individuals and community now and in the future. And it involves many, as uh, the initial uh, presenters said, multi-sectoral team that ensures that this is achieved. And I had uh, Dr. Roda Wanyezi talk about uh, her presentation in, uh, yes, how do we involve the multi-sectoral approach? Yes, I know I'm in academia, but on the other side of civil society, we actually think that increasingly in Africa, since we are talking about perspectives of health in Africa, there's been limited collaboration between academia and other multi-sectoral systems, more so agriculture, environment. So there's been more collaboration between university, academia to academia, and limited with the civil society that would actually advocate for their policies because they do research. And we need to actually get it out there as civil society. And uh, the other thing is there are many solutions that have been brought in down from academia from WHO, but we believe, and we've seen this with COVID-19, that we need to adopt them for our setting. We need to adopt them for our communities because it doesn't always work the way we think it would work. And COVID-19 has shown us that, that if we were more prepared as, uh, as a team for sustainable health, we would find that more people would have received better care, more people would have been uh, not pushed into poverty. And uh, of course, since we've said innovations and uh, Somia talked about the young population in Africa, many of our groups that we've dealt with have seen that in, Af in Africa, we still believe in people coming to, to the doctors, people coming for healthcare, what if we moved away from that model using the innovations that we have? So we have mobile, we have the mobile phone, we have all these other systems that we could use and leverage to get out there, get systems better, both education, improve social determinants of health. And we need to think through this and actually use civil society to advocate for the many beautiful innovations and the policy that have been developed, both in academia and research, because this is where we need to push it to. So, so there are humble perspectives are that we need to address the social determinants of health as the students have said, poverty, 
the environment and the community to move on to the sustainable health in Africa. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that beginning. Very important issue raised. Roy. Um, as, 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 as we wait uh, for Dr. Mugabe, I would like to take it now to Dr. Alan Mackenzie. And uh, Dr. Mackenzie, uh, you represent AstraZeneca. Uh, this is a large private uh, uh, sector stakeholder in healthcare. What does sustainable health mean to you uh, in the perspective of multinational private, uh, private health preneurs? Thank you, Dr. Roy and uh, uh, fellow um, and Tobias and fellow uh, panelists and speakers and uh, attendees. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. Indeed, uh, sustainable health is at the heart of what we do at AstraZeneca, and I'm very pleased that uh, uh, we had this opportunity to be part of uh, uh, this uh, conversation. As uh, you rightfully mentioned, uh, how we are known is that we are global, as you mentioned, and that um, uh, we're in the pharmaceutical uh, business. But um, if you look at um, uh, sustain, looking at sustainability, uh, building up on some of the previous speakers, the way they've said, I think Professor Otterson mentioned that we need to take care of the present uh, while not harming the future. And, and, and a lot of that has been repeated by the other speakers, including uh, the students. Uh, and really um, building up on this um, as industry uh, uh, or as private sector, uh, so looking at uh, sustainability, we must look uh, beyond access to medicines. And what uh, this means is that looking at the continuum of care, the continuum of care uh, from disease prevention to um, uh, screening to diagnosis to access to treatment. And most importantly, as has been mentioned, that. Um, the cracks in the health systems that have been exposed uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic needs us to work as, as part of the stakeholders to future-proof health systems uh, and strengthen them, improve their resilience to be able to handle current and future uh, health challenges. Particularly, I think it has been repeated uh, on the Mentimeter score and also results and also in the speakers here that uh, uh, we have communicable diseases and infectious diseases like the, one, like the current issue, the pandemic, and also we have non-communicable diseases. Um, and I think um, they, 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 there's a lot of, uh, there are many capabilities that are available within uh, the private sector. And as AstraZeneca, we, uh, we are using uh, our capabilities uh, to help address uh, the interconnectedness between um, the health of the planet, the health of the people, uh, and the health of business. So sort of seeing the interconnection between having a healthy business, um, uh, matching that with the needs of the society, and also ensuring that uh, uh, we are uh, cognizant of the limitations of the resources available on the planet. and so. If you look at the way we have structured uh, access or, or sustainable health in AstraZeneca, uh, we have um, uh, a big focus on health because we believe that our capabilities cannot can uh, our capabilities can provide the the, the, the the solutions with the biggest impact in health. Uh, we've also uh, focused on uh, the environment, um, looking at uh, ensuring that uh, in providing uh, or supporting the access to healthcare. Uh, we are friendly to the environment and also uh, to the planet. And then lastly, uh, the third bucket that we focus on is on ethics and transparency, ensuring that uh, we're doing uh, business uh, from an ethical and transparent perspective. And so um, if you look at the interconnectedness of, of you know, doing business, uh, uh, doing business, uh, addressing the society's needs, and also, um, uh, being um, uh, friendly to the to the environment, uh, there are key things that uh, we need to do as uh, as part of the these, these stakeholders. One of them is to um, uh, look at the challenges that are facing uh, health systems. And I'm glad that some of the work that we're doing in Uganda with the Ministry of Health uh, around NCDs um, and also with the Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership, uh, looking at uh, the impact of the environment actually on health as well. Like someone mentioned about lung, lung health, and uh, if you look at some of the uh, sources of fuel we have, 
um, uh, they, they, they have a direct impact on, on, on lung health, for example. And some of the work we are doing around, around ginger in, 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 in Uganda uh, looks at uh, working uh, with the local communities uh, and the Ministry of Health to address uh, how we're able to look at the environmental impact on health and also uh, looking at some of the biggest challenges, like for example, hypertension. Uh, Africa has the largest um, uh, prevalence of hypertension in any WHO uh, region. And some of the work we are doing with the Health at Africa program in Uganda and other countries in Africa are looking at strengthening um, uh, the communities to be able to, uh, someone mentioned uh, social determinants of health, to be able to know the risk factors and change their behavior. Uh, providing uh, or strengthening primary health care to be able to detect uh, some of these preventable um, uh, conditions early and also strengthening the healthcare system to be able to manage them should they come. A lot has been mentioned around partnerships and I think um, it's something that we, as industry, uh, the private sector, we're keen on uh, multi-stakeholder platforms. Uh, for example, uh, we're working with the Ministry of Health in Uganda on the private sector roundtable, contributing to supporting um, uh, uh, the global health security agenda in, in, in Uganda, uh, helping them prevent current and future uh, pandemics. And also, uh, you know, using that uh, capacity that we, 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 are, we are bringing on board to, to be able to um, handle other uh, health needs, for example, non-communicable diseases as mentioned. I think, um, you, I was very happy to see on the Mentimeter results that uh, equity was highlighted as a key thing. And we believe that uh, uh, no one should be discriminated for uh, achieving optimal health. And I think uh, as industry and as private sector, uh, we are open to working together with other stakeholders, with governments, with the civil society, uh, together with academia. Uh, 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 Professor Roda mentioned that uh, uh, collaborating with academia is, is, is key. And if you look at... Um, uh, the, the things that uh, were highlighted in our presentation, uh, you know, looking at the discrepancies in access to health, whether it's gender-based, whether it's region-based, I think uh, as as industry we have a role uh, and, and to to play in 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 breaking down the barriers to health equity. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Mackenzie, for that very enlightening. Our presentation uh, on the perspective of the private sector. Now, you not escape a question. Uh, uh, you talked about things like equity, resilience, improved health systems as key ingredients, and that rings the bell of, of research. Research is needed to provide the information uh, that on, on things that work uh, that can be injected into the health system. And on one, on the other hand, you have institutions in Africa that are reimagining themselves into research-led uh, universities like Makere University. So the question is, uh, what, uh, what do you see uh, as the role of the private sector in supporting research uh, that will further sustainable health? And do you have uh, a stake in that kind of research? We, we, we uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Roy. Uh, we, we do pride ourselves as being a uh, science-led uh, 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 biopharmaceutical business. And um, the foundation of our work is actually science. And um, if you look at our mission, um, we strive to stretch the boundaries of science to provide uh, healthcare solutions. And this science is largely uh, obviously built around research and work it Together with academia and also internal um, research capabilities within the organization. And there's, there's a role uh, definitely um, for private sector, as you mentioned. But one of the things that, uh, that, uh, that is important is to look at the needs, um, the needs of the people. What, what, what do the local uh, population need and how can we as industry get involved in that? There are issues around how do we, um, what is the framework of engagement, for example, between uh, governments and industry, between uh, academia and industry. Uh, there, there, there are some uh, areas that obviously need to be addressed um, uh, around that uh, uh, as, as a part of the, the conversation around research and, and, and our role. Uh, but also we see opportunities in, uh, in um, uh, availing our capabilities uh, to support local institutions, as you mentioned, uh, the University of Makerere. 
Uh, some of my, uh, when I was in medical school, some of my, my professors uh, were the first batch of doctors who were trained in Kenya and based in Nairobi. And uh, they were trained actually in Makerere. So uh, the first first doctors of Kenya were actually trained in Makerere. And so we, 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 the, it means that uh, th there's an opportunity to, to, to support uh, local institutions in Africa to be able to provide uh, capabilities that, that is through human resources or um, uh, looking at uh, focusing on the healthcare needs of the local African population, or in this case, uh, for example, Ugandan population. But um, uh, the framework of engagement is, is something that needs to be addressed. Uh, the other thing is uh, prioritizing, uh, prioritizing uh, um, uh, the research agenda um, or what, what needs to be in the research agenda and, and, and sort of uh, uh, making this uh, acceptable to, uh, to other stakeholders. Uh, by this I mean um, when you go to some of the countries you find that um, uh, there, there, there are mixed uh, there's a mixed basket when you ask about what are your priorities. So it is upon us as a part of the African continent to look at what do we prioritize and what will have the biggest impact uh, and how can we bring in uh, industry uh, capabilities uh, to address this. Thank you. Th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Mackenzie. And I'll pivot to Professor Stefan Peterson. Uh, Professor, you have been at the global stage coordinating initiatives to operationalize sustainable health. What are your experiences, your views on the task at hand uh, from the perspective of multilateral and international health organizations like UNICEF? Thank you. Uh, reflecting on my last four or five years uh, as chief of health for UNICEF, in fact, we summarized our thinking together with WHO and, and the, the Lancet in another commission called A Future for the World's Children. And based on that, I want to summarize this very quickly in five points. And one uh, has already been alluded to, the need to invest in our young people, our children, our youth, because they are the future in a very literal sense. Uh, and they are also representing the future of humanity. So it is an investment in the coming generations that we need to be making. And that's an in investment in all children everywhere, bringing in the equity argument, which is very key uh, for, for UNICEF and, and the multilateral thinking and uh, emanating from a human rights perspective, if you will. My second point that has also been made is that health is much more than healthcare. It's about food and nutrition. It's about the air we breathe. It's about the water we drink. Uh, it's about the schools we go to or not go to when they're closed down, as, as in Uganda and for hundreds of millions around the world now. Uh, but something I haven't heard is actually uh, the urban situation, the uh, urban planning, uh, all the housing issues, uh, the fact that many young people these days will grow up in cities and in what we may call a high density as neighborhoods as a euphemism for slums. And that's half the world's population now uh, that lives in, in urban areas and we're going on 70%. And that's a huge area to think about also multi-sectorally. And so I'd like to challenge all of that. Third point is also made nothing about us without us. Young people have agency, they know stuff uh, and we need to involve them and we need to find ways in governance also to think about and involve young people and think about their perspective also more explicitly. Health consequence descriptions, child consequence descriptions, whatnot, uh, if various decisions. Fourthly, uh, we talked about investing in children and that's a hard time now in, in terms of uh, economic recession that is hitting large parts of the world uh, under and following the COVID crisis. Uh, uh, however, we need to keep banging the voice, banging uh, the argument here that this is, is still true in the future and there's hardly any better use of investment than in the future of humanity. However, uh, I'd like to make an argument uh, to you listening in Uganda and elsewhere that it's also about the denominator. We can put in more resources in the denominator, but the denominator has the number of children. And it's also a question, most of the world is now going into uh, 
declining populations, but Uganda and others are still having children in abundance. And even you have children having children, the teenage pregnancies. And I think that's a bad recipe actually for investing in, in children's abilities and their potential. Uh, so please, uh, I, I think we need to take a good look at when we have children at the appropriate age, and that requires comprehensive sexual education, it requires family planning, uh, et cetera, and the number of children we eventually have so that we have the resources as parents and as nations to invest in them. And finally, I realize we're talking, the title of this session is Sustainable Health in Africa, but it is a worldwide issue. And even my country, Sweden, and the rest of the rich world, I would say, including China, have a huge effect, affect hugely your ability to bring about sustainable health. Because what we have done and what we are doing to the climate and the greenhouse gas emissions here, you are paying the price. So this is actually an issue about global uh, responsibility and saving humanity. But much as we all have a stake in it, I'm afraid that sustainable health in Africa is very much dependent on halting the climate catastrophe now. And that solution lies largely in, in other countries uh, than Africa. Over. Thanks yes. a lot, Stefan, for that. And uh, important to raise that, that the session was sustainable health in Africa, but this is a global issue and we have to work together. And talking about working together, we have now managed to have Dr. Mugabe from the Minister of Health in Uganda with us. Uh, warm welcome. And before that, I would like to tell all of you, we started half an hour late and we have now received uh, information from the organizers of the conference that we can continue with this session until another 20 minutes. So we will continue and we hope you all can stay on and continue the discussion. We will finish well advanced before 1.30 Uganda time, 12.30 Central European time. But please stay tuned and continue with the discussions right in the chat box when you have questions. But first, Dr. Mugabe, a warm welcome and great that you have managed to join. And you have substantial experience in the policy process for health within the government in Uganda. And from your perspective, what does sustainable health mean to you in the perspective of, for example, uh, making policies and in the government. Please, Dr. Mugabe. Uh, thank you very much. And sorry for the unsustainable internet connectivity that I've <laughs> suffered from. I think this one goes along and is showing how challenging sustainable health will be to achieve. In our experience, we understand that the health issues we are dealing with come from our environment, come from outside health. So for starters, we need broad policies in addressing, first of all, environmental issues to ensure that we have good air quality, we have good water, we have better waste management and sanitation. This one brings me to another point of multi-sector collaboration. We need policies that address and ensure that the government structures work together, not in the silos. There are efforts towards beginning to do that. Ministries have been clustered. In the next financial year, we wait to see how ministry, government ministries are going to work together in this. Each and every ministry is supposed to have some health related issues that they address. I'm talking about the Ministry of Health itself, water and the environment, local governments, internal affairs, just because we are interlinked. Thirdly, we need policies and on the public-private partnership. We are a very poor country. We have a public-private partnership act. We cannot generate the resources that we need. We cannot build all the hospitals that we want to build. We cannot equip all the hospitals. And we have had a very nasty experience with the COVID upsurge that we have gone through. So we need to strengthen policies that ensure that the private sector, those with resources, 
come into partnership with the government if we are to address the issues that affect the government. I cannot live without mentioning education. We need an educated population because we know that an educated population has a better health seeking uh, behavior, has a better understanding of health issues. So we need education policies that touch on the population, not only working towards educating the young people, but even the elderly. We cannot achieve sustainable health without broad socioeconomic policies. We want to industrialize, we want to conserve the environment. People need money, people are poor, people are hungry. There is a food in the other sections of the country. So we need that kind of uh, coordination, these kind of policies that cater for all all of these. We need robust investment policies in infrastructure, uh, strengthening the referral system. We need policies that emphasize disease prevention because what we are seeing is that uh, now as the Minister of Health, we can no longer talk on about infectious diseases or even non-infectious. I think epidemics are becoming more prone and all of these, we need really policies that should support us in making sure that the government will move in unison. Finally, we need globalization policies. As a country, we cannot stand alone and say, Uganda, we shall attain sustainable health. If our neighbors in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Rwanda, and our friends, in the, the US, in the UK, in Germany, and the others are, are not working together with us. So as, as I conclude, we need local policies, we need the regional policies, and we need global policies that bring us together to achieve sustainable areas. Even the developed still have issues. And we, the developing, also have very serious issues. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Mugabe. And you raised important issues about working outside the health sector and working local, regional, uh, national, and global. And we have received a question here in the chat relating to that. And what do you see, which are among the sectors in Uganda are most open to change to work multisectorial? And what do you see as the most important barriers and enablers to doing this? Uh, thank you very much. One of the barriers is financing. The other, is, the other barrier is uh, systems. What do we have in place? The policies that enable uh, the sectors to work together is also a barrier. We have not put in place policies that enable these sectors to work together. And uh, if these policies are in place, then these sectors would really work together. Uh, Thanks, Dr. Mugabe. Roy, over to you. You're on mute, Roy. Yes, we have come to the end of the panel, but we wanted to know if there are other burning questions from the audience that our panelists can take on. And this is open to both the panelists, but also the initial speakers. But there's a question here uh, uh, from the audience on SDGs uh, as the driving force for ensuring sustainable health, uh, disability, and people with disability incorporated in uh, the goals. And how do you see the links uh, with Rehabilitation 2030? Uh, uh, and uh, the disability acts and laws in the different countries. So if we can have a panelist uh, or a speaker talk about the issue of not leaving anyone behind, including the people with disabilities. Any discussant can take it on. Uh, Professor Stefan. 
Thank you. Uh, we, I was part of a, a report we put out uh, a year ago or so um, called the missing billion. And that was in relation to universal health coverage. And the fact that 1 billion people in the world have one form of disability or other, and that we need to ensure that these people are actually included and that universal health coverage is truly universal. And, and I, I think it's something that we need to always keep at the forefront and, and remind ourselves about the, in all of our policies because so often we overlook that. So definitely, a, I, I think it's crucial and universal means universal and that's not yet geographic. That also, it's about uh, equity uh, and, and bringing everyone uh, on, on board in, in all of what we do. And um, that said, obviously, when you are resource constrained, it can be harder, but let me tell you, even in Sweden, it is an issue that you need to keep reminding yourself about. Is this accessible to all, et cetera? The, the second aspect I wanted to bring up in reference to your question was the whole uh, SDG agenda and sustainable health. And I think the SDGs, as I've uh, interacted with them over the years now, since 2015, often becomes uh, someone saying, oh, I relate to SDG number three, and you relate to SDG number two, et cetera. And I think all of what we talked about is the multi-sectoral, integrated, and actions today. And I think we need an action agenda to realize the SDGs. And there's an action agenda around human development and optimal human development. There's another round around the energy transition. There's a one around the, the our farm, farming systems and the food systems. There's one around the cities, et cetera. And I think we need the narrative here. We need to put the child in the center of these SDGs and, of the, and, and maybe sustainable health going into the center of the SDGs. And we need to concentrate on what we do rather than just reciting goals and, and targets. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Stefan. And uh, uh, with those remarks, I think we are coming to the close of this very exciting discussion. Now, one would like to hear from all the audience uh, one more time. Get your phones again. Log on to menti.com. Uh, if you've not logged in before, uh, put in the code uh, uh, 92, uh, the code you can see on the screen. So put in that code, 9271. 8039 and answer that question. Having listened to what we've listened to, what does sustainable health mean to you? What does sustainable health mean to you? So uh, let's get, uh, let's try all to, to put in our thoughts uh, very quickly. Get to menti.com. Okay, we have uh, entries that have started coming in and you can see that the elephant in the room is equity. Keeps resonating, equity. But other key things that are coming out from the audience uh, uh, based on what has been uh, discussed is we are getting issues around collaboration, collaboration right from the first speakers. This has been resonating, uh, health for all, uh, I, that, that is in close linkage with the equity, uh, but issues of the environment, issues of one health, issues of justice also linked to equity, the universality, thinking of the future. And I remember someone who mentioned, we have to invest in our young people. Uh, so thinking of the future, um, so other issues, uh, uh, universal climate, multi-sectoral strategies uh, with planetary boundaries. Uh, so uh, you can see equity is still the elephant uh, in the room, uh, but collaboration coming in closely to that, multi-sectoral uh, still linked to collaboration, but working beyond our sectors uh, the issue of the environment and the future still outstanding. So with those, I think we have uh, given this session and the discussion justice. 
would like to have a concluding note, a quick remark from Tobias and I, and we close it. Tobias, uh, some final remarks? Yes, thanks a lot, Rod, and thanks to everybody for taking part in this. Uh, before we conclude, I believe that we have Professor Nawange with us. Is that correct? And if yes, Professor Nawange, would you like to say any concluding remarks before I try and finish? Michael, could you get Professor Nawangwe? Professor Nawangwe, your speaker is off. Yes, Roy, I've been listening attentively. What do you want me to do? Can you give us some closing remarks, some perspectives uh, uh, from, from, from your side? And uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank the speakers and the panelists for very interesting discussions. And uh, I want to thank my colleague, Professor Ole Peter Otterson, for personally participating in this and uh, for his presentation. I have learned a lot from all the discussions. And I think this is something that uh, we need to take further as the discussion should continue through the Center for Sustainable Health. Uh, uh, there are a few questions, that are, of course, uh, that are lingering in my mind, and the, especially when both Professor Ole Peterson and the, uh, uh, Professor Roda Wanyezi very strongly refer to both education and the, and the environment. And the, uh, my question is, when does the transformation in the education begin so that uh, uh, maybe the mindset of people changes? Is it at the level of the university or should this begin in the family? I, I think there is something that is uh, trending on the social media of how ch Japanese children are brought up. And it is something that is very interesting. Uh, the second one is uh, the issue of the environment. How much or how far should these uh, public health practitioners and the scientists involve politicians? Because uh, I think the, the biggest danger to the environment is the politicians. Uh, I, I, I have been thinking about uh, what is normally referred to as a the democratic world. And I know that uh, one leader of what is supposed to be the leader of the free world single-handedly withdrew the, uh, his country from WHO and the, from the other organizations that are supposed to be protecting the environment. And there was nobody who could say no. And I think there's a very big danger there. Uh, so how far can we, the public health specialists and the practitioners engage with these people to ensure that the things we are talking about that, you know, sustainable health will depend on a sustainable environment is actually realized. Uh, otherwise, I want to thank you very much for the presentations and uh, nice to see all the friends, of course, Professor uh, Ole and uh, Stefan whom I have not seen for very many years. At least I have seen him today. And uh, thank you for all the people who have discussed this very interesting uh, uh, subject. That's all I would like to say, Roy. Thank you thank very much. Thank you so much, Professor Nawangwe, for finishing with these words. And I think you concluded very well that we need to start both in the family and at the universities if we want to have a real change. And also the importance of science, although science cannot always get people to change their minds. And we heard about some world leaders withdrawing from both WHO and the Paris Agreement. Luckily, 
uh, he has been replaced and hopefully we can keep science high up on the agenda so we all can work together in getting sustainable health in the forefront, in the middle of the SDGs, so we all work together for a healthy and sustainable future. And I think this session has shown that sustainable health is a concept that we can use, we should use, we need to use, and we have that to put that center stage. And if you want to have more information about the work at the Center of Excellence for Sustainable Health, this very fruitful collaboration between Makerere and Karolinska University. Go to sesh.health, see what's going on. And also, if you want to follow us, uh, next time we meet, it will be the official launch of the Center of Excellence for Sustainable Health on the 16th of September. And there is already more information on our website. With that, again, a big thanks to Ole Petter, to Roda, to Somya, to our panelists, and then now also to Barnabas that you joined us at the end. Thank you so much for all of you keeping close contact and I'm looking forward to the rest of the World Health Summit in Kampala.